Hello and welcome to the High Functioning Hotspot. I'm Dr. Chloe Carmichael, a clinical psychologist in New York City, and I see clients all over the world as well. And this is my podcast about high functioning people. Today, I got to interview somebody super exciting. I got to interview Robert Glazer, who's the author of tons of incredible books. He's a member of YPO now. We met through Entrepreneurs Organization, but now that his revenue has grown so big, I think like 30 million or something he said during the interview, um, he's, he's, he's out of EO now and um, he's on to YPO and he's doing so many great things. Um, in this particular episode, really the purpose of the call was actually just because he was going to experience share with me um, around how to have a successful book launch. And I kind of sprung it on him at the beginning of the call. I was like, hey, do you mind if I record this? Because there might be other people that want to hear about this. Um, so if you're interested in Robert Glazer or you know how to have a successful book launch, then this would be a good podcast for you to listen to. So thanks, and I hope that you enjoy. Well, Robert, it is so nice of you to join me and share with me your experiences um, you know, about books. So um, just to recap a little bit of how we got here, I'm in the entrepreneurs organization and through that wonderful organization and the networking there, um, I was able to get an introduction to, to chat with you. Are you in EO as well yourself? Uh, I, I'm not this year, but yeah, I've been in EO for about uh, eight years and um, I was president of the Boston chapter and I've done some, a lot of the regional leadership stuff and ran a regional conference as well too. Wow, how come you, how did you know when the time came to leave EO? Um, my, I was in a forum, uh, a forum that was more regional and um, business has gotten a lot bigger and a, and a lot of folks left EO and then just honestly when the pandemic uh, hit, I had joined YPO, I, I, I sort of pulled back on things that are going to be virtual this year because I, I, I've reached um, sort of my capacity in that area. Um, so I decided this would be a, a good year to take off and, and uh, I, I did that with several commitments, kind of revisit when things are back in person. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So is YPO doing stuff in person? Um, I, no, no, but I, but I joined YPO and as I, well, I love the uh, YPO is now more relevant for my business. Um, we are about 200 people now globally. Um, so from just a size standpoint, um, I had actually not been in a Boston forum for a while. I was in a regional forum and then most people in that forum, we stayed together as a forum, but those people have sort of grown, grown out of EO. Um, so I just, I just didn't have a lot of connection to the, to, to the Boston chapter and, and without event, real events this year, um, I wasn't going to join a new forum. It seemed like a good, good year to take a sabbatical. Yeah. Yeah. So do you mind sharing with 200 employees what your revenue is looking like? Uh, yeah, our, our revenues are, uh, should be, you know, close to 30 million this year. That's got to just feel amazing. <laughs> Feels like a lot of work, <laughs> but, but yeah, I'm, when I, when I joined EO, our revenue was a million. Um, so, you know, I, I, I hugely credit EO to, you know, a lot of the principles and getting on that learning path and the EMP program, which just has a incredible track record. If someone did a case study on the growth rate of businesses that had been through EMP, I think it would be off the charts. What does EMP stand for? I don't even know. I'm uh, sorry. Entrepreneurial Master's Program. It's a three-year program you can apply to get into with about 100 people from around the world. It's kind of, it's targeted towards the kind of fastest growing businesses in EO, people who really want to, you know, double, triple their business. Yeah. So if I can share a little bit about, you know, my business goals with the book, because um, yeah. I also wanted to ask for your experiences and thoughts about that situation. Um, so with my business, I've primarily, um, my revenue has been made through one-to-one -one visits, either yeah. done by me or done by therapists that work for me. Yeah. Um, but I assume that's changed a lot in the last, uh, <laughs> last nine months. You know, honestly, that hasn't been a problem. Well, one-to-one, um, -one, you know, but it's probably, it's all virtual, right? Yeah. Well, everything is virtual, which yeah. honestly is totally fine for me. We did a lot of virtual work anyway, because a lot of our clients are all over the world. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's really more been about a desire to be able to pivot from being in a one-to-one -one space, which I do enjoy, but it doesn't scale. I, yeah. Yeah. Like 
there's only so much of me, right? And then I was finding that people who were coming to my office, you know, they were kind of okay, happy working with my therapists and they do great work together. But um, there's something, you know, about what I'm doing that I want to be able to, you know, bring it to people myself. Um, so I'm hoping to get more into like, I've, I've got some online courses and things yep. like that. And of course I mention all that stuff in the book. Um, but I don't know, like, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, when you first launched your book, your very first book before you were like Mr. Big Deal author and everything. Yeah. And by the way, my books had totally different pur purposes. So, so the first book was really tied to my business performance partnerships. That's probably the most most related um, because I, look, in, in most cases, you don't make any money selling a book, <laughs> probably, probably lose money by the time you get done with PR. So I think either it's either it's a platform to build a business, you know, and provides credibility. And that's really what performance partnerships did, or it's, it's sort of at the top of your pyramid, you know, it's the key piece at the top of a pyramid, which is then speaking and courses and things that all tend to make you know, more, more money than books. If you're trying to, again, get to one to, to many. Um, so uh, I, I think a lot of people get very confused about their goal for a book, right? And unless they're Malcolm Gladwell or, or Dan Pink or Adam Grant, you know, they're, they're, they're not professional writers are going to make a living off a book. And Tucker Max from Scribe really kind of taught me all of this <laughs> and, and just being really clear about what it is that you want, right? My, my performance partnership book, it almost doesn't matter if people buy it, right? It, it, it teaches people, it, 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 they learn about our industry. There's probably millions of dollars in revenue I can attribute to that book, but it's probably sold 10,000 copies, right? It's, it's, it's really an amazing business card for the platform of our, our business. The other books I are wanting to make more of a personal impact. So I do want to reach them in volume, but yeah, I mean, what, you know, one speaking opportunity can be this in for an hour can be the same royalty you make selling 7,500 books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I have so many questions for you because I like about speaking as well. Um, some people have told me like, oh, Chloe, don't really expect that the Macmillan Speakers Bureau is really going to like actually get you much like on the inbound side, you're going to have to go like get your they own. They won't unless they gave you a $500,000 advance. Okay. <laughs> you know, that, that, that is, there's one to two books each year that publishers really focus on. The rest of a book, you have to do all the marketing yourself. You have to hire a PR, you got to hire a person, you got to build a team. So to spend all that money, if you, if you got a, you know, no advance or a $10,000 advance, you, you got to really feel like there's something besides the book that's going to, give you the ROI on the back end. Mm -hmm. And so to that point, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure at this point, you're at a career at a point in your career where the inbounds for speaking and those very large figure um, speaking yeah. arrangements, they, they come in more naturally for you. But when you were first launching that first book and how, how did you start ginning up all that speaking and, and how did you know when it was time to raise your fees and, did you ever just, you know, start using an agent or did you handle it yourself? Uh, yeah, I handle it myself. The speakers bureaus only tend to work with high end, you know, 20 to 30 K. You, you can hire a PR firm. You can, there's some other stuff that you can do. But um, I think the way speaking goes is you start on the C circuit, you move to the B circuit, and then you try to move to the A circuit. And, you know, the way pricing goes is when, when there's more demand than supply that you want to do, you start raising your prices to constrict the amount of events you want to do, right? If there's if there's a hundred people that want to pay you a thousand dollars to speak, and you're like, wow, that sounds utterly exhausting, you know, I, I, why don't I make it two thousand, and that will knock out half the amount of people. So um, there's also, you know, you can tie speaking to distributing your book, or they buy your book, um, but but it's a little different for each place, right? There are. I speak for free at any of our industry events and give out the book because we're really, it's, you know, they don't pay people in their industry events, but if someone wants me to, and you have, there are events that lead to events, right? Um, so if there are a hundred CEOs that you're speaking to or a hundred marketing leaders from a company, um, you know, they could all go back and want to bring you to their company. If you're speaking to an executive team at a company or whatever, you're not going to get any referrals out of that. You just have to be careful about always trying to get the next event. 
those are ones you actually need to be paid for because you're there's no secondary value. The value should be what you're delivering to that group. You're not gonna, you know, there's some events that if it's 10,000 people and you say, look, they're asking me to do this in front of 10,000 people and, you know, I'm not getting paid or whatever, but I bet I can book 10 other paid speaking things. Like you kind of learn to feel these things out where, where, you know, it's high numbers or it's high influence. But, but again, it comes to what you want. Some people want money. Some people want to build their platform. You know, even if you told me I could get paid, you know, $25,000 a pop to speak, I don't want to be on doing that every week in a plane all around the world. Like some people do that. They're in fact, they're dying to get back to that. That's not the outcome that I, that I want. Right. I'm, I'm trying to make an impact and I think there's different ways to do that. I just launched my first course this week, you know, trying to, trying to experiment with how, how do you, how do you do more one to one to many, right? Cause when people then ask me for help on something one to one, it's, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't work very well. What platform did you launch your course on? Did it on Thinkific. Mm-hmm. That was and I was, I'm, I'm getting into wanted. courses too. Yeah. I was kind of a toss up between Thinkific and Kajabi. How did you choose Thinkific? Uh, just a bunch of people told me they liked it and were in the space. So. Yeah. So when you were launching that very first book again, like, um, did you have like, now there's these people, they're called launch managers. Um, like how did you, and I understand what you're saying that the goal wasn't even necessarily to sell a ton of books, but I mean, at the same time you wanted the books to do well, I'm sure. So can you just share how you, how you bootstrapped it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it costs time and money. So that's what I said. You got to have a clear plan. You know, I, I, I always had an assistant or someone that worked on it. Um, again, the first book was really tied to our business. So we had a whole plan on, on pushing in awareness and mailing, but, um, yeah, I mean, people spend a lot of money. They're going to, they're going to lose money on those launches. So they either have to believe they have a product or service on the back end, or they have a path to sell a hundred thousand dollars book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, by the way, what is um, a website where people could check out your course? And you want to tell us a little bit about it? Sure. It's at robertglazer.com. Um, and then you just click on the course tab. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a course on discovering your personal core values. So I talk a lot in Elevate and Friday Forward about spiritual capacity, figuring out what it is that you want most in life. And for most people, that's being able to clearly articulate core values so that they can make better decisions. And I always listed a bunch of resources and things in there, but people would ask me, are I really like, I want to do this core value thing. And I was like, I, I, I had built a process for our leadership training. We've done it with our leaders. I've tested over the years, but I was like, I just can't, I don't have a good way to like do it with you or for you. It's not, it's not just like, here's a link. So I built that process out that we used in our leadership training to, to a course after we had tested it for a while. And I think it really helps people get to a, an actionable list of core values that they can put on their desk and make decisions under. And so we launched, launched that yesterday, actually. And is it like a self-paced course or does it, okay. The actual course is about an hour. The work of discovering your core values is not an hour. You know, it it is, it's probably a couple of weeks or months of reflecting or testing it, but it gets you started on the process and it gets you saying, all right, here's a list. And let me, let me go a couple of weeks and see what comes up and then, you know, refine that. And it, and it gives you sort of an eight weeks of kind of tips and, and, and helpful on to do that. Again, based on me doing this personally with people and then following up with them and then seeing what worked to help them really break through. Most people's core values are pretty deep. They run back to, you know, childhood or something like that, uh, you know, formative experiences um, because that's what's really important to them. And when they put that connection together, it's, it, it's like, it's pretty powerful. How much does it cost? Uh, it's 79. Um, and there's a, I think an offer right now for 30 or 40 off if you use the code elevate. Uh huh. And how did you choose how much to price it at? Cause that's one of the things I'm struggling with, or I shouldn't say struggling, but grappling with. Yeah, I guess it's just sort of the goal. I, I really wanted like a million people to take this. And, and I think obviously if you're talking about a thousand or $2,000 course and ten, like I wanted them to get started and I wanted it to be accessible. So I think I, you can think about a mass market product or something that's really deep and that, you know, you could sell something to a thousand dollars to a thousand people or, you know, 10,000 people for a hundred dollars. They're different markets. And when I thought about the goal, the goal was to make the biggest impact and have the most people take it. 
you know, versus make the most amount of money. So I, I priced it where I thought it would just be a no brainer for anyone to do it. And, and if teams and companies want to do it, they could, they could do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I've thought about a lot of those same factors and, you know, at the same time, of course, if we make it too cheap, then I feel like people don't value it. So I have to say 79 is a good sweet spot number. I kind of like that one. Maybe I'll try it out. Yeah, like I think a thousand dollar course needs to be a lot longer, more robust. It, it, you might then, it's like a book. You might overdo it just to try to justify the price versus again, if you said, if I said, what's my goal? I said, if a million people took this and, and, you know, figured this out for themselves, that would be like an amazing outcome. And, and, so that, that was sort of my goal around the pricing. Mm -hmm. And how big is your mailing list? Uh, I have about 200,000 people that follow my Friday Ford, weekly Friday Ford. So I have a pretty good kind of built-in list. I had also been telling people the course was going to come out for a while and pre-signed up. And I had about a thousand people who had expressed interest in that. Yeah. Um, do you mind if I ask you a couple more questions about that? Because sure. I feel like the mailing list is such an important piece for so many people, myself included. Yeah. Um, how often do you email your mailing list? Because I'm always like, I don't want to harass them, but I also don't, you know, want to like fail to be in touch enough. So how often do you mail? You could segment. I mean, I send my Friday forward every Friday. That's something that people have signed up for. Um, otherwise, I tend to send a general thing maybe every four to eight weeks, but but usually it has some value or then it summarizes some key things. I I, I, I mean, I think you got to look at your unsubscribe rates and get a sense of is it is it too much? Is it not enough? Um, and, and, and there's a little trial and error there. Yeah. Well, that was actually one of my next questions is um, like I'm getting ready to like drop some people from my list because I've always had the philosophy like more is more if they're not opening the emails anyway like really who cares like what does it matter to me but now I'm moving on to HubSpot where I get charged by the contact and so I don't yeah. want to have people that are not engaged anymore because I don't want to pay you know to have them on my list so we're getting ready to send this thing to people that haven't opened an email with the subject line like are we pestering you and then inside we're going to be like do you want mail from us um, do you do that with your list and how long does somebody have to be inactive before they get that type of email from you? Um, I don't do that because I don't know. I mean, sometimes it's just different people are opening or not opening it. I, I understand it could, it brings above the th certain threshold sometimes, but I've actually seen with book emails that some people buy it on the first time. Some people buy it on the third time. Maybe they didn't open it that week because it was a Tuesday and they didn't see it. So some the reason to do that I actually think more than cost uh, is is deliverability. Um, sometimes you know the higher the deliverability rate, if you have a lot of bad emails, then the better. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I I get what you mean that like I certainly wouldn't like think of like disincluding someone just because like they missed an email on Tuesday once, but like when when do you start or or do you ever like kind of prune people out of your list because they haven't opened an email in x number of weeks or months i don't i, I haven't ah interesting and is that because you just feel like you never know when somebody might come yeah, alive I, 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 the only to me the only reason like the extra 50 dollars or whatever is not a big deal I, the, the downside would be if 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 the deliverability of the email went down because you had a low open rate. Like I know it's one of the things that the ISPs sort of look at. So that's the only reason I would do it if it felt like there were a bunch of bad emails on it. So I know I'm starting to run to the end of your time. I'm not going to keep you all day, but I did want to ask, um, is there anything that like I have not asked um, kind of like letters to a young author from Robert Glazer? Yeah, I, th th there's, uh, two things I would say. The Stephen Covey, start with the end in mind. Like, what's the goal? Because there's a lot of things, a lot of distractions. Sometimes you do all this stuff and you forget why you're doing it. Again, you can run a money losing book launch that then has no back end to it, right? Um, and then the other thing is focus on the 80-20 rule. People will give you a lot of ideas. Like, it's usually one or two tactics done well that work. Just like doing 10 social media channels half-assed doesn't work. I think doing a couple things for your book launch pretty well that 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 work uh, are, are, are gonna be most important. Trying to boil the ocean will just not, doesn't work. 
So well said, Robert Glazer. I can't thank you enough for joining me today and for giving me permission to record and share this because I know lots of other people would like to hear these words as well. Thanks, Chloe. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Wow, that was a great conversation with Robert Glazer. Um, he's got so many interesting tips to share, and I think he's so right that starting with the end in mind is really important. So I'm definitely going to think a lot about the goals that I might have for my book. I actually um, stopped offering individual psychotherapy somewhat recently. I'm taking a sabbatical from that. So um, I'm really thinking a lot about you know expanding more into courses and ways that I can reach more people. Um, so if that's something that you are interested in you know taking courses and things like that from me um i'm actually you know going to be looking for you know people that might even be open to taking the course for free um, in exchange for sharing your feedback or sharing with your network and things like that or send me a message on social media i'm on twitter instagram facebook like everywhere so just google my name and you can um, find me there. And of course, we'll also put Robert Glazer's information in the show notes as well, in case you want to connect with him and take his course too. It sounded great. Okay. Well, have a great day, everyone.